Hey guys, in this video we're going to take a look at the hardware that I've been gathering for months now that will go in the new server. And, well, if you watch my channel, since I've finally been able to build my Ryzen 3000 desktop, the Ryzen 1700 and this AX Gaming, AX370 Gaming 5 is now finally free. So, I can start the server build. So, this video will take a closer look at what hardware I've been gathering and why. So, to start, I'm building about a 100 terabyte server, and although I do use some enterprise guidelines, and I work in enterprise storage, stuff like that, this server is built with well, sort of a budget in mind. So although I do follow some guidelines, I don't follow them all. I use shared resources and I don't use ECC memory, for instance. But if you know what the server is intended for, and well, this is a home usage server, although I do store my footage for my channel on there and stuff like that. Still, if it would fail for some reason, I can always uh, fix it myself, and a few hours of downtime or even a day isn't that much of a problem. Uh, so with that in mind, let's take a look at the motherboard first. As I mentioned during the intro, uh, the gaming, the AX370 Gaming 5 came out of my desktop. I've been running this one for uh, about two and a half years now, just like the Ryzen 1700 that's in there. It's been overclocked to 4 GHz, but for server duties, I've actually downclocked it to 3.6 GHz because I was able to get away with an undervolt, which means the server now uses less power. And for a system that's on 24-7 a day, less power usage is good. And well, the performance gain from 3.6 to 4 GHz, although interesting on the desktop, with 8 cores, it's not really interesting on a server where you have some VMs or containers and well, your storage running. So that's a good trade-off to make, in my opinion. So this motherboard has been serving me fine and two and a half years isn't that old for this kind of component. So I'm moving it to the server. But this is a desktop motherboard and that comes with some limitations. Using a Ryzen 1700 and the X370 chipset, you basically get 24 PCIe Gen 3 lanes from the CPU. Most often, this is divided into times 16 for the first slot for your GPU, or dual to times 8 for a dual GPU or a GPU and another PCI card. Then you get four PCIe lanes which go to the M2 slot, and then you get four PCIe lanes which go to the chipset, and that makes 24. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting. I want to use two of those LSI HBA cards, which will use both of the times eight slots. Then the only times 16 slot, well, physically that's left, is the bottom slot, but that's actually a times four gen two slot from the chipset. Gen two is instead of one gigabyte per second per lane, like gen three is, only 500 megabytes a second. But the signaling was still different, so effectively you get about 400 megabytes a second per Gen 2 lane. With four lanes, that would have been enough for a single 10 gigabit connection to my uh, Intel X540 uh, with one 10 gig copper connector. But, um, well, I also need to connect a video card. And as you can see, or, well, if I hold it up, as you can see, there's only three times 16 slot where that would possibly fit in. Well, Zotac came to the rescue because I found this guy, and this guy is a times one Gen 3, but it'll also work in Gen 2, um, GeForce GT710. Now, the specifications don't really bother me all that much. I'd like a VGA port and an HDMI port, which it has. And, well, it has a times one slot, so I can insert it into one of the slots and at least have a console out. The downside of that is, though, that because uh, the way the chipset is configured, that means that the times four slot, which is the bottom... Uh, hold on, let me 
which is the bottom times 16 slot, but as you can see in the back, it's only times four electrically, um, will go down to times two. Now that's cutting it awfully close because times two times 400 megabytes a second is only 800 megabytes a second and not a thousand like 10 gigabits should be able to deliver. Now, again, this is a home server and I'm making compromises in respect to cost and stuff like that. So even if my network card on, only delivers 800 megabytes a second, I'd be fine with that. But if it dips much lower, that might actually be an issue. So I'm first going to try this configuration and see if it works because I'd rather keep the two LSI cards with all the hard disks connected because then if ZFS wants to run a scrub, especially over the SSDs or the multiple pools, it won't be bandwidth limited, which an LSI card might be if it's in the bottom slot. And as I said, 800 megabytes a second over the network is fine for me. I actually have two gigabit ports on the motherboard also. So those don't share bandwidth with anything else. So I could even use those to offload something like IP cameras or stuff like that. And who knows if it really doesn't want to work the way I want it to, because all the Gen 2, 3 mixing and stuff like that, it could just not work. I can always get a SAS expander, but again, I'd rather use the two LSI cards. So here's a uh, little overlay on the screen for the layout I have chosen. And if you're looking to build a server yourself with a desktop board, it can really pay off looking in your manual or at least on the specification website of your motherboard uh, manufacturer, how the PCIe lanes are laid out and what certain limitations maybe are. Of course, you can make other choices, uh, especially if you don't have the hardware yet. I already have this board. As I said, it was in my desktop. Um, but if you're buying new, I think it's still a valid choice. Um, most people don't want to hook up 24 drives. Um, so you can go one LSI card and then you have the two times X slots for the LSI card and the network card. Perfect. Um, but otherwise, you could maybe look into Th Threadripper or X299. Now, Threadripper, for instance, comes with 64 PCI lanes instead of 24, so that's a whole lot more, but you'll also be paying for that. So it's all kind of weight versus performance comparison. And as I said, if I get the 800 megabytes a second I'm wanting out of this, that's fine. So choices, choices, but uh, let's continue. So that's kind of it for the, uh, for the PCI cards. Um, for the RAID cards, as I mentioned before, in the last video, we did uh, cable length testing and stuff like that. So I have uh, all my um, SFF8087 cables and uh, I have a second um, LSI SAS controller, basically. There is still one in my server, but that will be transferred over once the data is off of the old server and on the new server. And... Um, yeah, I have some of these um, whoop, breakout cables. So this is a reverse SAS cable with which I can get, use four motherboard SATA ports and plug it into a SAS backplane. And then these are just four normal uh, SATA SAS connectors to use the hot swap base I built in also in the previous video. So that should take care of most of the cabling needs for all the disks and SSDs. One last thing about the PCI cards, they all have uh, small heat sinks on them, but they expect server airflow. So if you look at this one, it, it does have a tiny heat sink, but it, as I said, it expects server airflow to stay cool in high usage environments. Now I've been running these and also 10 gigabit NICs without the heat sinks on there for a few years now. And as long as you provide ample airflow in your case, which also hits these heat sinks, you're fine. But I don't know it in this build because there's gonna be a lot of PCI cards in there. So if it turns out that it's not enough, I will probably add a little uh, 40 millimeter Noctua fan to all of these. And well, that will be a separate video. What is in fact going to be a separate video all in itself is I'm going to use the server stock as it was delivered using a, well, I guess you could say stock AMD heatsink. Now this is the heatsink that came with my 3900X. Um, 
because the 1700 didn't come with heatsink whatsoever, but I kind of want to illustrate the difference between using the stock coolers and fans and then switching to Noctua for basically, well, everything. One last thing I forgot to mention on the motherboard. I have 64 gigabytes of officially uh, 2400 megahertz memory Castlin C15, I believe. But since I've been running this in my desktop for a few months now, I've been tinkering with it. And without raising the voltage too much, I'm able to run these modules with all four installed at 2733 megahertz. So that's kind of a little bit of an overclock, but as we all know, Ryzen really loves its memory bandwidth and or memory speed actually. And even though I'm running four of these modules, that's been working fine for months now. So that should be great. Um, one thing of note, no, this is not ECC memory. And yes, I am running ZFS. I'm going to be really short about this. Yes, adding ECC memory will give you extra protection above not running it, especially with ZFS. If your memory might make a calculation error, ZFS might not catch it, where ECC might have protected you in that case. But that doesn't mean ZFS is useless without ECC memory. I've been running ZFS for, I don't know, six years without ECC memory, and it hasn't had any issue whatsoever. If a disk, however, still encounters bit rot or any, anything else which ZFS is good for, it'll still protect you with or without ECC memory. ECC memory is a lot more expensive and a lot lower frequency, and I already had this memory. So that's why I'm doing that. This is a conscious choice, and ZFS isn't useless, as some might lead you to believe, without ECC memory. Besides, ZFS brings a lot more to the table than just error correction. It's a great um, storage manager with data sets and multiple pools and VDEFs and stuff like that. It has integrated compression and it has a lot of features I like. So yeah, uh, either deal with it or not. Let me know down in the comments what your thoughts are about this, but uh, let's continue with the hardware. As a power supply, I'm going to reuse more old hardware. In one of my old desktops or systems, I have an AX860i. Now I'm normally a Seasonic person, but I've had this power supply for years and it's been very reliable. And recently someone actually wrote some Linux open source project that can read out the power statistics from the power supply. And it'd be nice to be able to graph or follow how much uh, energy the server is using for specific tasks or idle or if disks are spun down or not. And well, it's a, it's a decent power supply, so I think it'll run easily for another few years. So that's power. Let's talk SSDs. Because next to just storage, of course, I also want to run some containers and VMs on a server. Why otherwise run Proxmox? So I already mentioned um, the 960 Pro that's in the M2 slot on the motherboard. This is a 512 gigabyte model, and I'll be using that for L2 Arc. Now, controversially, I have a few pools that I'll be running and I'll be using the same caching SSDs for all the pools. Now, I know this is not done in the enterprise, but in a home situation where access patterns and the amount of users are limited, I think it'll run fine. My choice, you can disagree. Again, that's what the comments are for. Let me know what you think and constructively comment why you think that, please. And uh, yeah, so that's on the motherboard. And since it's MLC memory, it should last for quite a while, even though it's getting a lot of reads and writes. And uh, I'll also be over provisioning all the SSDs I'm talking about here, but there will be a separate video talking about uh, rate levels and uh, SSDs and stuff like that and over provisioning, things like that. So for boot, I'm again reusing some old SSDs. And these are two 256 gigabyte, I have to hold them the right way up, um, Samsung 840 Pros. Now, I've already had these for years, but their current wear level is around, at around 80%. That means they have plenty of writes left, or wear level is at 20%, there's 80% lifetime left. Yeah. Um, these will be running in a mirror and are basically just for boot and stuff like that. Then I have uh, two newer Samsung SSDs, and these are two 
Samsung 860 Evos. Um, these are one terabyte and these will be my main storage, again, in a mirror for my VMs and my containers. Um, I've run servers with these in there before and they provide great performance as long as the sustained load isn't more than 30, 40 gigabytes at a time. But using VMs, there's a lot of parallel traffic and a lot of queue depth, which gets generated by that. And these perform really well, in my opinion. Then for, um, I want to run a Zill or S-Log. You can, if you're not familiar with CFS, you can kind of describe that as a write cache. It's not really that but it can help you uh, alleviate some of the downsides of running disks for storage. Now, these are Seagate Ironwolf 110 SSDs. These actually feel quite heavy. Why is that? Anyway, these are 960 gigabytes, and I, I, ha I have two. And the reason they're this big is because I want to run a lot of writes through them. And the bigger an SSD is, the more writes it can theoretically handle, especially if you over-provision them. As I said, I'll be running multiple disk pools, and these will be the Zill S-Log for multiple pools. Now I know you shouldn't do that, and it, it'll influence the behavior of the other pools and slow things down, etc. But on the other hand, uh, Zill and S-Log is a single queue process, and writing with multiple streams to the same SSD should still give you a higher performance. And as I mentioned, this is a home server. I'm going to stop defending myself. If you have issues, let me know down, down in the comments. Um, but what makes these special is that they have a very high endurance rating. So I believe um, three terabytes a day, something like that. Uh, I'll have the specs on the screen. And they also have power loss protection. Now, I don't have personal experience with them yet. This will be the first server I'm using them in. But from uh, looking at their specifications, they should do really well, especially because I'm only going to be using 100 gigs or something like that, and all of the rest is left for over-provisioning so that the controller will have an easy time and I can have lots and lots and lots of writes on these things. Great. As you've been able to see in my previous video, the server has 20 drive bays and I've added four SSD hot swap bays. Now we talked about the SSDs, but what kind of disks am I going to use? Well, uh, you can't really see it here, but I have a stack of six 10 terabyte Iron Wolf drives from Seagate. Uh, the current server is already running two times 10 terabytes. And I have other servers running with four times 12 and another one with four times uh, five times 10 and some other servers with two times 10. And I really like these Seagate drives. They have a great performance. They're 7,200 RPM, but despite that, they have a very low idle wattage. And that's what's most important to me. You get 10 terabytes for about four watts of idle. But I'll be doing a separate video about that, why I chose 10 terabyte drives and not four, six, or eight. So in total, there's going to be eight of these drives and I'll be configuring those in a mirror or a RAID 10 or a pool with four mirrored VDEVs, whatever you want to call it. So that means I'll have 40 terabytes of effective storage in that pool and I'll also have caching SSDs. Now there's Two more pools I'm going to create. There's five times four terabytes in my current server in a RAID Z1. And once all the data has been moved to the uh, 40 terabyte pool, I'm going to empty that pool and move, move those disks over. Now, those have been running for five to six years now. So instead of making them a RAID Z1, I'm going to make them a RAID Z2 because I expect at some point, some disks will start failing. Moving even further to the past, I also have five times two terabytes. Again, I'm going to put those in the chassis. I mean, I've got drive bays for days. And I'm also going to configure those in a RAID Z2. And I'm going to be experimenting with um, drive spin down and maybe just having those available for people who want some external backup and back it up to my location and stuff like that. So basically they'll be off like 90% of the time to save some power. And well, I think that builds a complete server, PC or whatever you want to call it. 
As I mentioned, I'm going to start with stock cooling, so the stock fans and uh, a stock AMD heatsink, and then I'll do a separate video comparing replacing all those components with Noctua fans and, well, measure or listen or whatever what kind of difference that makes. Again, this is a home environment. In a server room, maybe the noise doesn't matter, but when they're back here, it certainly does. Now, the last part I wanted to end this video with is preparations. So to prepare, I took each of those uh, of these 10 terabyte drives and I had them hooked up to a separate PC and I ran HDAT2, which is a disk checking tool, and I verified all the disks. This takes about 13 hours for every disk, but after that, I'm sure there aren't any bad factors to start out with. Same goes for the older SSDs. I checked them using some tools, but I didn't run a full verify, of course, but I made sure these have the latest new firmware and also the LSI card I'm going to use. I made sure had the newest firmware. That's from 2016, I believe, but still the current one in the server when I'm moving that one over still has older firmware, but I don't want to upgrade it while I'm running if I don't have to. So I think that brings us to the end of the video. As I said, lots of videos coming, like uh, my partition layout, um, ZFS RAID stuff, uh, why I chose 10 terabyte drives and not others. And I'm also planning on doing a Proxmox installation video and some other videos regarding the server. If you're interested in that, um, let me know down in the comments what you would like to see. Maybe give this video a like, dislike if you, you know, hate my face or whatever. And maybe subscribe to see the rest of the videos. Thank you for watching. Oh, and um, since I'm a YouTube channel and I kind of need to make money to do this stuff, there will be affiliate links to all these components in the description. And if you're looking to buy something like that, uh, well, watch the rest of the videos to see how they perform. And uh, if you're willing to use my links, thank you very much. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.